Okay, good morning. We are in the middle of chapter 10. Hopefully we'll conclude it today. And we are discussing a very uh, fundamental, important idea in Hasidus. But to get there, let's backtrack just a tiny bit because we missed a week. Let's see what we'll talk about what we're up to. We discussed that the difference between Tshuva Ilah and Tshuva Tata, Tshuva Tata being the lower level of Tshuva and Tshuva Ilah being the higher level of Tshuva, two very powerful, both of them are very advanced levels of a true teshuva. The difference primarily is tshuva tata means I'm removing all the negative that happened in my life, all the sinful, inappropriate behaviors, conduct, etc. And I'm going back to a place how I was before I sinned. I'm going to the pristine stage that I was at birth. That is tshuva tata. Tshuva ilo, we said, was a much greater level. It's tashuv el Hashem. It's going back to Hashem. I'm returning to how I was before I was born. What's the difference? Before I sinned, I was an identity. I was myself. It was me. I now became that which God blew the, the ear of life, the ear of the breath of the soul into my nostrils, and it gave me life, and I became a separate being, and I worship, I serve Hashem. Shuvah means I'm no longer a separate entity. I don't see myself as something separate from God. I am one with God as I was before birth. As it was before I was created, which means I'm not just going back to pre-sin, I'm going back to pre-existence, pre-separate entity, pre-ego, pre-self, pre pre-being pre separated from God. It's a very high level of existence. And we said the way we do it is we remove all sense of self. When we spoke about how we do that, was primarily um we we explained through the idea of Torah and through the idea of Gmilta Sadam. Through studying Torah, we tap into a level of godliness that's bestowed upon us, a very powerful level of godliness. Also, when we do mitzvahs because they're God's will and we do what God wants, it bestows upon us a tremendous level of godliness. And that oneness that we, come, that, that we become is becoming one with God. That's how we explain it in chapter 7, 8, we get to a 9, etc. In chapter 10, we start explaining something else. In chapter 9, comes out what makes us tshuva ilah level, tshuva ilah status. That means we go back three separate from God. It is despite ourselves, despite our existence, despite our shortcomings, despite doesn't matter who we are. Despite us, it's a level from above that comes down and overwhelms us, and that's what we become part of that. In, in chapter 10, we started saying something much greater, something much more advanced. Not that we become one with God. Despite ourselves, we become one with God because of ourselves, meaning we change ourselves, we, tr we transform ourselves. We no longer are a separate entity, not because we don't matter, we don't count. We are here, but we're no longer a separate independence. In other words, the metaphor that I could think of, and I don't remember if I gave it last time or not, I think we did talk about it, is the idea of a window. What does that mean? I transform myself that I no longer have an identity. What is my identity? Not that I don't exist. I don't exist as a separate entity. My whole self is something bigger. In other words, I become a window. What's a window? A window means, yes, I'm made of glass. I have a frame. I'm opening in the wall. But the whole existence I have is not for me. It's to see past me. When someone walks over to look at me, 99.9% of the people are not coming to see me. They're coming to see what's beyond me. In other words, I become a venue, a vehicle, a, a medium to seeing what's beyond the window. I become nothing more and nothing less than that which is behind me with that which I represent. In other words, I become a window to Hashem, which is by the way how we refer to tzaddikim. We hang out and we love and we admire and we talk about a tzaddik all day long, not because we're not talking about Hashem, because that's our window to God. How do we see God? Stand next to a tzaddik and look at him. You stand about, it's like the world has a wall, a brick wall, and we can't see past it. Open up a window, that's where I want to stand. Not that I don't exist. No, I exist, but I'm a window. My whole identity is something beyond myself, that comes by transforming ourselves, that we're no longer a brick wall, we're no longer a wall, we're no longer an existence. We transform ourselves into something, something much greater than ourselves. We have become, through our effort, through our work, something greater than ourselves. In other words, we're not overwhelmed and cease to exist. We're own inspired and we cease to exist. In other words, our ceasing to have, our ceasing and our stopping to have an ego and a sense of self is not because we're overwhelmed. Because we inspire, we we came to a level where I put myself completely aside. I don't matter. It's like the love that you have to a very, very close friend or someone you really care about. 
that you're willing and really able to put self aside. Why? Because it's not about me. I didn't come here for me. I came here for you. I'm here completely for you. And therefore, there's no me in this picture. It's all about you. This is something, the difference between these two levels is called milmaila lamata and milmata lamaila. From above down, from top down or bottom up. What does that mean? Sometimes we could become transformed because God overwhelms us and he does something with tremendous light energy and we're overwhelmed. We become no longer, we, we are completely melted away. We completely cease to have identity for ourselves. That's called a mile lamata. That is the act of Torah study. When we study Torah, a tremendous light from above comes and overwhelms us and we cease to have a separate identity. When we go and do certain mitzvahs in the right way, we can become overwhelmed. There we lose our identity because we're overwhelmed from above. Then there's something called a mata lamaila from bottom up. What is that? Not that I'm overwhelmed from above. I work on myself and I transform myself. Where is that? That's davening. That is the world of davening where I transform and I change myself. I transform myself. And it's through the effort and preparation and the davening. Davening, it says, is a battle. It's, it's, a, it's a tremendous journey of struggle. It's the true service of the heart because you're able to put everything aside and become in tune with godliness. As you spoke a number of times, tefillah doesn't mean to pray. It doesn't mean to request. It means to connect. The word tefillah, we said, comes to, it comes to the word teufel, like tefillin. It's bonding. We become one with God, not because God overwhelmed us. It's because we reached up and we worked on ourselves and we got to that place. So it comes out that if you take tshuva ilah and tshuva tata, tshuva tata is a preparation that you have to do, first remove all negative energy, all and some people are born that way, and some people sin and have to make rectify, rectify it, have to make a teshuva to remove the sin, remove the negative energy. Then we come to the second level of called tshuva ilah. Now with tshuva ilah, there's a split. There's tshuva ilah, which goes from my lamata, which goes from above, coming down to overwhelm us, which is Torah study and mitzvahs. And then we have tshuva ilah, which is a mata lamayla, the other track, which comes from our own effort, our work, we get there, not from God doing it to us, but we earned it, so to speak. We, we get there through our efforts. That's through the avoid of davening, which is the matal Yes. Would you say that maybe uh, balot shavot are in each one? Shuvayla, I, Both. Shuvata, uh, bal -shuvah, Both. Balot shuvah but is... But you need a preparation to go through... The only difference in the balot shuvah and a regular tzaddik mm -hmm. is how they had a first do tshuva mm -hmm. tata. A balot shuvah, let's say a person who lived their life eating pork, or, 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 or being a thief, whatever, whether it was through all different levels of a person's journey, why they got there, whether it was mistakes or on purpose, but a person does tshuva. That, that's a tshuva tato. That's the first thing. Through We said before, we're going to get back to it later. Bitterness, uh, realizing mercy on your soul, getting to that place where you remove all the negative, all that all that energy that you were, heart, which was being siphoned off to the klippa, you're no longer doing it. You, you sort of re-harness it all, the holiness. And that's a complete process of teshuva, teshuva tata. I come to a stage of pre-sin. I'm pristine, like the way I was born. That, even about teshuva, everyone does. Everyone could that too. A tzaddik, a person who never sinned, is still the teshuva ilah. And we'll see teshuva ilah as many, many, many layers, as we'll, we'll, we'll discover. But the bottom line is, because how much a person could love, how much a person could feel, how much a person could connect, is endless. There's all different levels, how, how humble you could feel, how one you could feel, as we'll see. So that is that. That's so in Shuvah Ilah. You have two tracks: Milmaila Lamata, which is the, from above, top down, which is Dav, which is Torah study and mitzvahs, and then from the Milmata Lamaila, which is the bottom up, which is Avodas Atfila. Yeah. We are up to now going into in the davening itself. We're going to split that in two. So we just took Shuvah Ilah, split it into Milmata Lamaila, Milmata Lamata, and now we said Milmata Lamaila from down up is davening. In davening itself, we're going to split that into two stages. That's what we're doing now. Today, we're going to go and take davening and divide that too into two, as we'll see, two stages. And we'll see that. Okay. We are up to, we're on page mm -hmm. uh, 198. Right. And we are... Uh, the second line, because I marked. Maybe begam. Begam achir. I, I might have said this quickly last time. Let's go back. Let's go back a couple lines. Okay. Um... Okay, I was going to start from when we achar, but let's go back to these lines here. Okay, begam. Let's start with begam. Okay. So now we're going back till before we divide it. Now we're going back till just begam is talking about in the avodah of tefillah itself, the 
the track of in the in Tfilo, the track of Lamata Lamaila. Davening is the path of going from my effort going upwards. And Avagam Acharat Fila Imrim Elecha Hashem Nafshi Esa. And even when davening is over, we don't say, okay, I davened, and now I got there. Now I could go on. No. A true tzaddik, that means someone who gets this level of true v'ilah, when da- you see, a benini, when davening ends, your feeling of spirituality can end too. We mentioned in the in the early discussion of the benini, the benini has a very interesting journey. That he, while he davens, he can reach the level of a tzaddik. What's the difference with a benini, with benini and a tzaddik? If you remember, we said a tzaddik is someone, that's actually today's Tanya, we started chapter um, 10. We started getting into the discussion. I think it's chapter 10. We started today. Yes. Uh, and that is, we dis- what is a tzaddik? A tzaddik is unique from a benini. Both of them never do a sin in their lifetime. A tzaddik doesn't want to sin. Doesn't have an attraction to sin. We say today that there's two levels in a tzaddik. The he who doesn't want to sin and he who is repulsed by sin. Repulsed by sin is a higher level of tzaddik because the more you love something, the more you reject that which is anti that which you love. For example, if you love um, an Israeli soldier, or if you love somebody in Israel, and an Arab comes and murders them, then if you really love them, then you actually hate and despise and you find the Arab terrorist repulsive. If you love them a little bit, uh, it's okay. So everyone has their opinion. I see their point of view. Meaning, the more you love somebody, the more you hate that which wants to destroy it. Unfortunately, if someone doesn't have the same feeling for someone dying in the, some other place, so you think it's wrong, but the hate is not there the same way. Why? Someone, the more you love someone, the more the closer the person is to you, the more you will hate that which is going against it, that which is trying to destroy it. Uh, so we said, but the bottom line is, what's a, what's the idea of a tzaddik? A tzaddik is someone who has no attraction to sin. No attraction to sin. A benli does, but he controls himself. By davening, every person can be a tzaddik. You can go into a zone. Right now, I'm not interested in sin. A person who gets into a good zone of davening. Say Shabbos morning or any time that you're getting into a good davening gishmak. The guy who's davening, the woman who's davening right now, doesn't think, man, I wish I could have a good piece of schnitzel. Man, if I could have only a good... I don't want that right now. I just want to daven. So that means you're in that zone of the tzaddik zone. But that doesn't last. When davening's over, check the wings, I'll have plenty. You know, <laughs> whatever you want. Suddenly, davening's over. You can have the same attraction for the material like pursuits. Why? Not that you were fake during davening. You entered a special gift that we explained in Tanya. Davening has a special gift to enter that zone. So, back to our case here. But what? For some people, yeah. Most people, when they daven, they have a lot of different things. Not, not the people I know. The people are sure that daven is serious. Oh, Maybe in other places. <laughs> now, the tzaddik, when he davens, that feeling stays on. So, therefore, when the person who is a true v'ila, when he davens, and during davening, he's feeling this oneness with God, when davening ends, it doesn't go, okay, school's out. You know, it's not like, you know, it's over. It, when davening ends, it continues. And not just lingers. It's just as strong. So that's what he says. When nafshi, we say, uh, we say that we say here, the By that tzaddik, he remains in that state all 24-7. It's not when davening is over. Okay, that's done. You continue it the same way. The kol zeh, all this comes from what? The effort that you put in, the motivation, the meditation, the thinking, the concentration, the deep, deep thinking into the tremendous greatness of God, with the true depth of Das. And Das means not just you know it, but you feel it. I just saw a beautiful uh, thing this morning on Ayem Yem. Ayem Yem today talks about you know, the desire for Mashiach, the, the, the World War II. Very, it's a hard Ayem Yem today, it's a very difficult one. But somebody once came to the Rebbe by for bringing and asked the Rebbe, why do you say so much that the Mash- the, uh, then over and over to the them that Mashiach is coming, Mashiach is coming, Mashiach is coming. Didn't they get the message right? Doesn't everyone get the message? Mashiach is coming. Why do you have to keep saying it over and over? The Rebbe turned to him and asked him, let me ask you a question. You know, Mr. whatever, so-and-so, would you lend him a large sum of money? He said, of course. He said, would you lend him a large sum of money and tell him to get paid back when Mashiach comes? <laughs> I said, mm. he says, that's why I got to keep talking. <laughs> it's one thing to say, I know that Mashiach is coming. Can I borrow your screwdriver and give it back to you? Mashiach comes. Can I borrow a thousand dollars? Meaning, how much is it in the reality? In other words, is your the Hamaka Sadas means that I brought it down, not just that I know spiritually a good feeling, an idea. I'm actually 
living with it. Hamak as das means it becomes deeply part of me. Das, as we know, means connection. Mm-hmm. It's one with me. How does that happen? Vishtayim alafoneha. With the two um, brachas we say before the Shema, or Besukah de Zimra and Kaneda, and all the blessings of uh, when we praise Hashem, Besukah de Zimra, which means if somebody davens and says the blessings of Baruch Amar and the blessings of all the, uh, the Halukas and all the prayers and all the blessings of Shema and the Shema, by the time you get to that Midah, you're standing in a place of connection to God, and that stays you the entire day. And that's the idea of you know, Mila It's your effort that you come on with God. You actually come one. You realize I don't exist separately. There's no Moishi Rabbah port. There's no separate me. Part of the big picture. It's not that I don't exist. I don't exist independently. I'm not a separate existence. It's a phenomenal idea to get to that point. I am part of God's big picture. I am part of God's oneness. I am part of God's essence. There's no separate, there's no there's no disconnect. Now he's gonna say even deeper. You have to have, you have, in, to have in, in, both the tshuva ila and the tshuva tata. What does that mean? We said this is all in the track of tshuva ila. You have this track called the mata lamaila from the bottom up. In the bottom up, we also have tshuva tata and tshuva ila. What's tshuva tata? Tshuva tata, we said, is the stage of remorse, um, bitterness, and mercy on my soul and myself to get past all my shortcomings, get past my mistakes, my sins, whatever I've done. It's a serious, it's more of a somber, it's more of a, it's more of a very, it's a bitter sort of sad, I don't want to say, we don't have a sad Judaism, mm-hmm. but it's a bitter, it's a, it's a remorseful, it's thoughtful. And then you come to Shuvita, Shuvila, which is going to be the happy stuff, the connected God. These are the two stages, says, before davening and davening itself. Let's see this here. If davening is Shuvila, Truvila always has to have before Truva Tata. He says, everybody, everyone needs Truva Tata. So, you have to first have the lower level of Truva. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. And we're going to say, what does that mean? That means the pre- preparation for davening. You can't just walk in and arrive in davening. If davening starts 645, you can't walk in 645 if you want to daven. You could. But if you want to reach davening Truvila level, which the Rebbe told people that that be every single day, it could be once a week, whatever each person does. On the level for most people, it's Shabbos morning. If they want to take it serious, come to early, learn a little bit, think, spend time, and get into a mode to daven properly. You can't just, it's not a, like a bar mitzvah. You can't just walk surprise, you bar mitzvah. <laughs> it's got to be preparation. Learn, daven, learn the laws. So, this is why I say, just tell us, but Mishnah, mm-hmm. you could only go to daven with a seriousness of heart. Kevedresh means literally a heavy head. You have to go with a point where your head is heavy with something. Heavy head means, lightheaded means, woo, I'm silly, I'm goofy, I don't, nothing matters, I can come in and just, boom, you know, just all goof around. Heavy headed means heavy minded. Why, why so heavy? You see a person, there's something heavy resting on their head. What is it? Sometimes it could be a, a mortgage you got to get paid or bills or a medical problem or a dispute. Sometimes it could be something serious like I'm going to Davin. I'm in a very serious mood so I'm walking in to talk to God. So he says, Upirish Rashi, Rashi explains there on the Mishnah, this is a Mishnayis, Rashi says on there on the Mishnah, mm-hmm. what does it mean, Koyvadresh? He says it means achna. It means to be bent, it means to come with humility, to come with a, a, a bentness. And he says, is tshuva tata. that's a talking about the idea of tshuva tata, lo love tshuva, le'ere rachmim kenal, to emer- arouse mercy. Like we said before, there's two stages of, of Truva Tata is number one, to feel bitterness of look what I caused. Look what I did. Look what I look what I did. My my imperfections caused Hashem's energy diverted and siphoned off to evilness, to klipa, to all the all, look at have on my soul, have on the God that's being affected. And the whole approach is a real responsibility. Hello, Kanal could the Yalaf Hassan Bigamara. I like the Gemara there learns out after the Mishnah, the It says about Chana, all the laws of davening, or many laws of davening, we learn from Chana. And it says, Chana, when she came to the Mishkan to cry, to for, and beg God for her son, it says she was very emotional, she was very bitter. And then she prayed quietly to herself, the whole story. So it says the first stage of her davening was a bitterness, a very deep bitterness of the heart, a brokenness. And then, of course, later she was filled with joy. So this brokenness, we learn from Chana, you have to come in with means you have to come to Shul in a serious mode. You don't come in, you know, with a giggle. Mm-hmm. Hey, we're in Shul. 
It's a seriousness. But we have a question. We find in the Brysa, the Brysa says, You can't come with the shoulder pressed when you're daven. You got to daven with joy. Da, da, da. I'm going to daven. We got to be joyous. We got to come with energy and with happiness. So how do you have these two things? Come in serious and happy. <laughs> well, are you seriously happy? <laughs> then what does it mean to be serious and, and bent and, and with a bitter and then happy? Uh, how do you have both? It's like, what is this? The question is, how can a person get there? And the answer is, this is what this is about. The ability to have an emotional self guided and directed by intellectual self. You see, when you're just a, an emotional person, you're right. I'm happy now. How can I be sad? I'm sad that I can be happy. But when someone has a tremendous intellectual capacity and they can realize there's reason now to be happy and reason to be sad. A very, and by the way, one of the times we have this going on now is with the, with the soldiers went to war. On one hand, there were broken bitterness for what happened, atrocities that we should never know the real story that happened. What really went on on October 7th, I think none of us know, none of us should know how far the atrocities went. But those who do know were affected, and the same people had to get themselves energized and pumped up and upbeat and optimistic to go to battle. How do you do that? It's a tremendous intellectual strength. It's not emotional strength. It's intellectual strength that could guide, and then you have emotional strength. So he said like this. I, I, I'm sorry. I think because they saw what happened, they have all this strength to do it. Very hard. Very good. That, There's a truth that, to what you're saying. There's a truth to what you're saying that because they saw what happened, it gave them the power to go as we done. But there's a difference between going to get revenge if the uh, tears running down your face and crying and optimistic. You saw something that was almost didn't make sense. The soldiers were dancing when they went to war. They were uplifting them. They would do, it, was a major, it was a major effort by the leaders in the military. They actually sent out people who were professional entertainers to go and singers to go mm -hmm. and boost up the morale of the soldiers to get them to the point you cannot go fight a war when you're down. And the soldiers were down in the beginning. They were broken. What happened? So the motivation, they didn't need any motivation. That was their uh, nuclear power motivation from what they what happened. But to go joyously is a tremendous, it's a tremendous thing. It's, it's, it's deep. It's very deep to go there. He's like this. So the way to do it is there's a process where a person could, is able to go and actually transform themselves. The great, great, holy Hasidim didn't have a problem doing this. They could sit down and get very, very, um, like it says, we had in Tanya, when, or um, uh, the, what's the expression we say there? Um, I forget the expression right now. From all bitterness comes out joy. Meaning a lot of times you can get from a moment of bitterness, you could transform that into joy. We have to know how. He says, the Chassidim in Amol, this is the Alter Rebbe speaking. <laughs> Alter Rebbe talking. In the old days, the Alter Rebbe is the old days for us, 200, 250 years ago. <laughs> We're, the Alter Rebbe says, back in the day, we'll see in a minute, they could do this. But how to do it today? How do today we go and do this? How do we go today? Because in the olden times, people had such strong intellectual capacities that they could think deeply into the remorse. A few moments to think about the opportunity where they're going. And they could jump into Javani with such joy you won't know the same guy of five minutes ago as tears running down his face. Famous story with Shmuel Munkus. Shmuel Munkus is a famous story on Tisha B'av. He was, um, uh, he, Tisha B'av amongst Hasidim, used to be a thing, not to get too overly, outwardly depressed. Don't make it, uh, don't make some, oh, it's a serious thing. It becomes like an external, almost like a game. I'm sad, it's Tisha B'av. So the Hasidim used to like throw, don't get too externally, joy, you know, serious, do cry. So Shmuel Munkus was famous, it was famous that he used to throw little um, sticky things little plants called burrs, they would throw them on people to stick to the shirts and make a little shtick on Tisha B'Av so to soften the sadness. So this person came by, this great child that came by, and he said, you know what? It's people like this by the temples that have not rebuilt yet. <laughs> and then they come, he's walking further, a little while later, he sees a person sitting on the floor, broken and crying and davening. And he says, it's people like this, that the basement will come back. And he walks around with the same guy, Shmuel Munkus. Shmuel Munkus is the same guy. And Shmuel Mungus had the ability to know when, when and where. I mean, the ability to have full control of your emotions, that's a very high level. Mm -hmm. The Alter Rebbe says, how do we do it today? He's like this. Azai, he says, sorry, here. 
And our generation is an orphan generation. Why is it called orphan? What does he mean orphan? Orphan or what? Simply it means you don't have the greats, but on a deeper level, it means orphan means you didn't have parents. What is parents? Chachma and Bina. We learned in the beginning of Tanya that the father is Chachma and the mother is Bina. If we're lacking today the true strength of Chachma, not that we're fools, God forbid. Not that we don't get it. We get it. We're very smart people. People are good at math and good at science and good at studying Torah and good at Chassidus. But the, the deep, deep intellectual capacity to transform yourself, that's lacking today. He says, when we're orphaned, meaning from the ability to implement our true intellectual strengths, not every single person. Meaning some people could still do it. Tamar. Some people could still do it. Go and transform themselves completely in a moment. But not everybody could do it. How do you do it? You know what? You're right. You can't do it in one minute. Start the night before. Get up at midnight and be bitter at midnight. And take, it says, Tegnat says, you get up after midnight and you cry and you think about the Mason Mikdash was destroyed. And you think about all these thoughts of seriousness and our responsibility as a Jew. And you get into a very, very serious and, and sort of a bitter, bitter mode. And then by the time morning comes along, four or five, six hours later, and you get up with I can go and come down with joy. So those people that can't go straight from uh, the bitterness into the joy, the Alter Rebbe doesn't say, don't be uh, joyous. He says, move back the um, bitterness a few hours earlier. And then maybe you'll be able to have enough time to transform. And now he says, What about a guy says, I can't do this every night. I can't every night get up, but I won't, I won't sleep. I'll be having a headache. I can't, I can't function every night getting up. But he says, no problem. Once a week, do it. Do it once before Shabbos. Why before Shabbos? The Shabbos, we know, is also Chuvila. Shabbos is known as the Chuvila of the week. The whole week you do Chuvila Tata. And Shabbos is called Chuvila, the higher level of Chuvila. Like it's known to those who know ideas in Hasidus. Shabbos, he begins Chuvila. We know that Shabbos comes from the letters Tshuva Ilah. Sorry, sorry. It's Tshuva Ilah comes from the letters Shabbos. I say it's Tashiv. The word Shabbos comes from the word Tashiv to return. To return in the ultimate sense. Like it says Tashiv Enish. And the Rebbe points out, why does he say Tashiv Enish here? Just say Tashiv. He says that there's four ways we describe a human being. We have Adam, Ish, Gever, Enish. The lowest level is Enish. Enish is the lowest level. And it says, mm-hmm. even someone who's an enish, even someone who's not the highest level, not the, the lowest level, also Shabbos could be a mensch. They say Shabbos, even an Amaretz doesn't lie, even an ignorant person doesn't lie. Meaning, Shabbos, everyone acts, acts differently. Shabbos, everyone has the right and the ability to act differently. You can't say, I'm, I'm not such a good guy. Shabbos will have a different window, different soul, different existence. So even, says so Shabbos, everyone could tap into this true law. Ki Shabbos, he aliyas, eilis, l'mikhedem chulu. On Shabbos, it says, what does it mean that Hashem rests on Shabbos? It means the worlds go back to the pre-existent state. The worlds go back to that oneness with God that we say every Friday night. Raza the Shabbos, like a Gavna, talks about the oneness of Shabbos. Everything is really back into the one. So that's the idea we said, what's Shuvay law? Going back to that one, going back to that pre, pre-birth, going back to that pre-separate existence. In other words, Shabbos is in the, is the macro what we are in the micro. In the micro, we are Shuvay law means I personally go back to my pre-birth existence. Shabbos, the world goes back to its pre-existent state, pre-existence existence. In other words, how it's found within God, pre-existence, that absolute oneness. Shabbos is called the oneness of Shabbos because Shabbos is no world and God. Shabbos has revealed the truth that the world and God is one. The famous things that Avram went around teaching the world, Al he said he used to teach the world, not Kel Ha'elam, but Kel Elam. Not that God is the God of the world, but God world. What's God world mean? The world is not separate from God. If you say God of the world, it means there's God. And there's a world. And God is the God of the world. But if you say God world, it means, in, in Hebrew it's more correct, it means there's God. And that God also includes the world. There's no world outside of God. That's all one. And that's what Shabbos says. Shabbos, that, that truth is always true. But the truth comes revealed on Shabbos. Obifrat. Feel as Shabbos with Dalin, especially during the davenings of Shabbos, we reach a higher state. As you can imagine, a person who reaches reaches that state during during davening during the week. Imagine during the week you could reach that state of Truvila. We said feel as Truvila. Imagine Shabbos as Truvila. Imagine davening on Shabbos. That's Truvila of Truvila. 
it's like the 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 pinnacle of pinnacles. It's the shuvila, which is that's in general tefillah davening. On Shabbos and shuvila, that's a, it's like we you know, we say in general Shabbos afternoon. It's called the that Ivan, the most most desirable time before God. Why do we say that? We say every time every day mincha time is a special time before God to ask your prayers. All famous historical prayers were answered during mincha. Shabbos, the whole day, is a special time. So Shabbos afternoon mincha is the time to ask your prayers. Very special. That's why we don't on Chabad have a meal Shabbos afternoon. We sing the gunim, we do something else for bring because you don't want to have just the materialistic experience at that time, something even more spiritual. But the bottom line is davening on Shabbos is the teshuvi law of teshuvi law. Wow. yuvan. Now the Alter Rebbe is going back and explaining on this whole last 9 and 10th chapter. He said, now we can understand something very beautiful. We can understand as follows. We explain that there's two journeys. There's Truva Ila and there's Truva Tata. The lower level of Truva, which is removing the sin, and the higher level of Truva of coming home to God, coming home to that first pure one estate. He said, the Pasuk says, this is, this is in Yeshaya, where it says, I will conceal your sins, like the, like I'll, I'll, I'll erase your sins, which were like clouds, and your and your transgressions, which were like thick clouds, and I will, um, uh, you will turn to me and I'll redeem you. That's what the verse says, chapter 44, I think it's verse 40, um, verse 22. So, I think it's 44, 22, or 49, 22. Bottom line is, so, uh, the way the Alter explains this pasuk as follows: Beautiful, he says. It says, "Shuve elai pigi al ticha." Return to me, because I have redeemed you. Shuve elai means return to me. Pigi al ticha means because I redeemed you. It seems to be like a double statement. Return to me, because I redeemed you. So he said like this: Read it. The the verse starts off. Uh, something. So then it says, uh, So we explain it like this. What does it mean? Because I have erased your sins, you could return to me. And then I will redeem you and bring you home on the level of Shuvela. So Shuvela is Shuvatata. I'm, re- I'm removing your sins. So you go back to the pristine state. That's Shuvatata. That's Shuvela. And Kigaltiha is even a higher level. I'm redeeming you, you're coming home 100%. And that's not just away from sins, but even return to me pre-existence. That is it means, it's removing the negative energy, the clipper. And I redeem you from all the negatives with a tremendous arousal of mercy. Because you began on your own process. The universe of the Sata means from below. You the true that talk now. As I true lie, but true lie. Then we turn to the true lie. In other words, there are two stages to this process. There's a stage of true lie of true and the Yaltiha, where I'll help you come and find me through your efforts. I will help you come home, not just the true that but the true lie as well. The Rebbe says from this chapter, we see something phenomenal. What do you see from these two chapters? We see. The two extremes, how both sides can do the do both sides. We'll see both a tzaddik and a balchuva need both. What does it mean? A balchuva can't say, "Listen, I sinned. How am I going to reach tshuva So he tells you, even a person who does tshuva tata can come and achieve tshuva Even even if you did sins and needed the tshuva tata, don't think it's unaccessible, and you could do tshuva And then he says, "You the tshuva don't think you're only true tata. You also have to have the preparation for davening. The metaphor of davening is you can't just say, you know what, we said before, if davening is true ilah, then you must have true tata before. What does it mean? That even if you're a tzaddik, you can't just go to true ilah. You have to on some level. So how does a tzaddik have true tata? Obviously, it's a much more advanced. Everybody has a different journey, what's called good and what's called better. You know, you take a diamond. There's diamonds that have all different levels of clarity, all different levels of perfection. And you can say this diamond is worth you know, 5000 10000 15000 or you compare it to a $100,000 diamond or a half million dollar diamond. I mean, you're getting this. There's so many factors. Compared to that one, this is like, I don't want to say it's junk, but I wouldn't put that in the king's crown. So the bottom line is always levels of what's called good quality, high quality, better quality. And the, the point is that for us, that the tshuva tata, 
which is our journey to remove the negative personal journeys that we've done and serving selfish needs or self, that is a big butt job. And that requires serious self-searching and work. And you might say to yourself, how am I ever going to get the Tshuva Yilah? So he says, no, it's your job too. Not only you have to do Tshuva Tata, you have to get the Tshuva Yilah. We have to get there. Maybe we won't be there all day. Maybe just on, maybe just during davening. Maybe just on Shabbos during davening. Maybe once a week. But it's not exempt from us. And this is the end of chapter 10 where he explains that Tshuva Yilah is something that comes through self-effort, self-discovery, even though, yes, there are times you can get there with a gift from God, it's not the same as you get there with your own effort. And this is the end of chapter 10, and Amir Tashem next week, we'll begin chapter 11. Thank you, Rabbi Moshe. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Yeah, we have a question here, yes? Why would a tzaddik has no desire to do anything when we show at the ta'a? Why would a tzaddik who has no desire of anything self, why would he need Shuvah Tata? The truth is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why, because I can't think of a reason why. Yeah, I can't think of it. The only thing I could say is that I saw the Rebbe writes in, this, in the talk that there are so many gradient levels of what's called service. Uh, we talk about, for example, Moshe Rabbeinu, Davar Melach. We know that these person never did anything for self, right? They would never self Davar Melach. Never in his life did something for selfish reasons because he didn't have a Yitzhara. Dovan HaMelech says, did not have an evil inclination. Did not. People go on to examine the story of Bathsheba. How did he go and tell Bathsheba, his husband, to go into the war to get killed? And then he went and married Bathsheba. It seems to be something which has some sort of personal uh, involvement. That's because we're looking from a simple way. But in Dovan HaMelech's world, there was no self there. Why did he do those things? Purely because this was how Hashem wanted him to do it. He knew Hashem wanted etc. 